Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Women's Health Podcast, A Woman's Journey, Insights That Matter. I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, and I invite you to listen to Johns Hopkins specialists discuss the latest topics in women's health. Now here's your host, Lily Shockney. Hi, this is Lily Shockney from A Woman's Journey at Johns Hopkins, and this is our podcast, Insights That Matter. Today, we are joined by neuroscientist Mark Matson, professor of neurosciences at the Johns Hopkins University, and who has studied the health impact of intermittent fasting for over 25 years. Dr. Matson, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Well, I'm looking forward to our conversation, Lily. Let's talk about what intermittent fasting is. It's my understanding that there are several types of categories for this, such as daily time-restricted feeding, which narrows eating times to two to six hours per day, and so-called five to two intermittent fastings, to which people limit themselves to one moderate-sized meal two days each week. So is there one that works better than the other, or do they both work, or are you still studying both to find out if either work? First, I'll define intermittent fasting, what it is and what it is not. Intermittent fasting is an eating pattern. It is not a diet. A diet is what you eat and how much. Intermittent fasting is independent of what you're eating and how much you're eating. It's an eating pattern in which there's periods of time of not eating that are sufficient to cause what we call a metabolic switch from liver glucose stores to fat stores and ketones. Typical American eating pattern, three meals a day plus an evening snack. It's not intermittent fasting because there's no time sufficient to cause that metabolic switch, which takes about 12 hours to occur. An eating pattern such as a daily time-restricted eating where you constrain the time window you eat to, say, six to eight hours, that would be intermittent fasting because you would be going 16 to 18 hours a day with no food, and that's sufficient to start burning fat. For many people, that's the easiest eating pattern for intermittent fasting because it's a daily habit when you eat, and you can incorporate it into a lifestyle where you can still have lunch with friends or coworkers. What a lot of people do is skip breakfast and then eat all their food between, say, noon and 6 o'clock or noon and 7 o'clock. A 5-2 intermittent fasting approach, that came about through a collaboration that I did with Dr. Michelle Harvey in England. Women who are at risk for breast cancer because they're overweight and they have a family history. We published two papers, one in 2011, one in 2013. They each involved about 100 women randomly assigned to either what's now called 5-2 intermittent fasting. We actually didn't call it that at the time. So two days a week, as you mentioned, the women ate only about 500 calories. The other five days... They were told, just eat normally, don't purposely overeat. And then we had a control group of women who had ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they had about 20 to 25% fewer calories than they normally took in. The reason we did that is we figured out that their weekly calorie intake for both groups would be the same. Six-month studies, both groups of women lost the same amount of weight, about 8% of their initial body weight. Both groups showed improvements in health indicators, but the women on 5-2 intermittent fasting showed greater improvements in blood glucose regulation, and they lost more abdominal fat. So that actually led to the popularization of intermittent fasting because a producer at the BBC picked up on our studies when we published them, and he did a documentary on it. He wrote a book and then kind of snowballed on the internet. You mentioned that these were patients that were at higher risk for breast cancer. Yes. So how was that measured? Just indirectly, in as much as being overweight or someone with obesity are at increased risk for breast cancer compared to someone else of the same age that has a low body weight. They lost weight. Also, the improvement in glucose regulation and the switching to burning fats on those two days is actually important because there's now studies, multiple studies going on in women with breast cancer after they've had surgery to remove the tumor. And then during the time that they're getting chemotherapy, investigators are putting them on intermittent fasting. And the reason is most cancer cells rely mostly on glucose for their energy. 
whereas our cells in our body and brain can use either glucose or ketones from fat. And so the idea is, and it's been shown in animal studies, that if you hit the cancer cells with the toxic chemotherapeutic drugs, when their energy levels are low, then they're more vulnerable to being killed by the chemotherapeutic drugs. So this is exciting and has, in my view, there's a good potential for fasting during chemo or radiation therapy as an approach to enhancing the effectiveness, maybe even lowering the dose of the drug. And also intermittent fasting, we think, can reduce the side effects of the chemotherapeutic drugs because it has good effects on normal cells. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'm a 28-year breast cancer survivors, so it's great to hear this kind of progress. I'm glad you survived and you look like you're doing great. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit more also about intermittent fasting and what effects that it may have on the brain. Obviously, with the body, we know that she's going to shrink some, which is usually a good thing. Tell us a little bit more about the brain. There was an investigator at the University of Wisconsin a long time ago. Well, it was in the 80s, 1980s. He took rats and he put them on different levels of calorie restriction and showed that it extends their lifespan when it started when they're young. And then he took out the different organs, the heart, the liver, the brain, and weighed them, even with severe calorie restriction, almost to the point of starvation. Every organ in the body gets smaller, but the brain doesn't. Wow. It's protected. And that kind of makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint that If you're an animal where food is scarce, you haven't been able to get food for a long time, your brain better be working well. You're going to have to figure out how to get the food. But anyway, as far as effects of intermittent fasting on the brain, we started studying this back in the 1990s when I was a professor at University of Kentucky. We'd been working on trying to understand what goes wrong in the brain in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, stroke. These are all age-related disorders, that is to say, older people are more likely to develop these. For Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and stroke, aging is a major risk factor. And since this investigator I mentioned at the University of Wisconsin showed that, at least in animals, intermittent fasting and calorie restriction can have an anti-aging effect, if you will, or at least slow down, apparently, the aging process, we asked a simple question. In animal models that are relevant to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and stroke, which there are such models, that is models that in which you can cause selective degeneration of neurons involved in learning and memory in an Alzheimer's disease model or the dopamine producing neurons that degenerate in a Parkinson's model, and then a stroke model that physically occlude one of the blood vessels in the brain and shut off the blood supply. So we did these simple experiments. We took rats or mice, divided them into two groups. One group was on every other day fasting for several months. The other group not. That is to say they had food every day, which is a normal condition for lab animals. What we found, and it was very striking, was that nerve cells in the brains of the animals on intermittent fasting were more resistant to being damaged and killed in these experimental models of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and stroke. Then I was recruited to Baltimore, actually to the National Institute on Aging as a laboratory chief. I knew Saul Snyder because of the neuroscience field, and we had a little bit of overlap in some of the basic research we were doing. So he essentially invited me to join the faculty at Hopkins. So when I came to Baltimore, we started looking very intensively at what's happening in the brain at the levels of the individual nerve cells, even at the molecular level, the genetic level, gene expression level in animals that are on intermittent fasting eating pattern compared to their usual ad lib eating pattern. And the bottom line is the intermittent fasting affects nerve cells in ways that helps the nerve cells resist stress. They're more resilient and less likely to degenerate during aging and in these experimental models of neurodegenerative disorders. We also found that the intermittent fasting affects nerve cell network activity in the brain in interesting ways. We recently had a paper in Nature Communications where we were recording electrical activity in the brains of animals that had been on intermittent fasting or not. And what we found was very interesting. There's an increase in activity of a neurotransmitter called GABA. And this is the anti-anxiety neurotransmitter. It calms neural network activity and keeps activity from going out of control. Epilepsy is the classic example of nerve cell network activity going out of control. You get seizures, which is continuous 
excitation in neural networks. So we found intermittent fasting calms neural network activity and at the same time improves cognition, at least in rats and mice. This hasn't been established in humans yet. There are studies ongoing, including one I'm involved with to test that. Good. Wow. That's a lot of information. So you talked a little bit about obesity. Can you also talk about impact that it may have that would benefit those with high cholesterol, blood pressure, cancer we've talked about, but also diabetes and heart disease? I'll start with diabetes. I mentioned uh, intermittent fasting can improve glucose regulation. There are a couple studies published now in in people with type 2 diabetes, and that's what actually work in animals and humans has focused on type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, the problem is that cells in your body and brain, we think, don't respond to insulin well, and so they're not able to remove glucose from the blood in response to insulin. So people with type 2 diabetes, they'll have high blood sugar levels, and they'll also have high insulin levels. Their pancreas is fitting out a lot more insulin, trying to overcome the inability of cells to respond to insulin. So that's called insulin resistance. And intermittent fasting can reverse insulin resistance in animals. There's studies coming out, one out, suggesting it can also reverse insulin resistance in people with prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. Maybe help them get off drugs if they're taking Yeah. Them. Now, type 1 diabetes, I would not recommend that someone try intermittent fasting by themselves if they have type 1 diabetes. And the reason is they're taking insulin. Insulin lowers blood glucose. And there's a potential, although we don't know for sure, of fasting to exacerbate hypoglycemia. Uh-huh. Get their so for, for blood now, sugar numbers too low. Yeah. Hypertension you mentioned, Uh cardiovascular disease. One of the effects of intermittent fasting that's been documented first in my lab in animals and then subsequently by investigators at Washington University in St. Louis is that animals and people on intermittent fasting, and it takes a while, like a month, several weeks to a month to see this effect, but intermittent fasting will result in a reduction in blood pressure, resting heart rate. And that's actually similar to regular aerobic exercise. In our animal studies, we've shown that intermittent fasting has a similar general effect on what's called the autonomic nervous system, which controls heart rate. There's the sympathetic nervous system, which is activated when you're scared or under stress, and it will increase heart rate. And then the parasympathetic nervous system slows heart rate. Endurance athletes have increased activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, which means they have slower heart rate, lower blood pressure. And intermittent fasting does a similar thing, although its effect is not quite as strong as exercise. Exercise is more powerful, beneficial effects on the heart, we think. Another area is inflammatory disorders, which actually involves a lot of the different disorders. It involves inflammation of tissues. That's true in cardiovascular disease. And then there are diseases like multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel diseases like colitis and so on. There's evidence from animal studies and humans that intermittent fasting can reduce inflammation. An investigator at Hopkins, Ellen Mowry, she's a clinician who works with multiple sclerosis patients. She's done a few initial small studies with intermittent fasting and MS patients, and those results look promising, and she's planning bigger studies longer term to look at whether intermittent fasting can lessen the symptoms and maybe the course of the disease. What about Alzheimer's, which I know our listeners worry about, whether they worry about it for themselves or for their spouse, perhaps their parents? How could this potentially fit in to prevention or reduction in the symptoms? Alzheimer's disease is an area that I have a lot of expertise in. So I mentioned aging is the major risk factor. Intermittent fasting seems to decelerate or slow down aging. My own view on Alzheimer's disease is one that I'm not too optimistic that anytime soon there's going to be a drug that has any major effect on the course of the disease in someone who is already symptomatic. And my view is that we need to be thinking about this early in life and modifying our lifestyles in ways that evidence suggests can at least delay the onset of Alzheimer's. There's two main reasons there is such a big increase in the number of people with Alzheimer's disease in the last few decades and which is continuing to accelerate. One is that baby boomers 
people born right after World War II are now entering the age range that's the danger zone for Alzheimer's, 65 to 85. But another reason is, it's actually, a, in one way, a good reason is that advances in early diagnosis and treatment of cardiovascular disease, cancers, you're an example there, and diabetes have allowed people who would, may have previously died, say, from a heart attack when they're in their 50s or 60s, they get a bypass, they now living 70, 80. Unfortunately, some of the same risk factors for heart disease, diabetes, and cancers are risk factors for Alzheimer's, a cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's, and that's sedentary lifestyle, overeating, and in the case of Alzheimer's, not keeping your mind intellectually challenged. There's good epidemiological evidence that all of those three lifestyle factors can affect risk for Alzheimer's. When someone is fasting, and we know this from we're asking a patient to purposefully fast before a test or an operation, something that's going to require us more than likely to put them to sleep or to have their stomach definitely empty or their entire colon empty. Sometimes patients will say, well, now I don't have any energy. I can't do anything because I needed that jolt of whatever it is that they usually have at lunch or dinner or in the middle of the day, or, you know, I missed my bowl of ice cream. It gave me energy. <laughs> what impact might that have on someone's ability to function well on the days that they are fasting yep. or are intermittently fasting? Good question. The key point here is that it takes time for the body and brain to adapt to an intermittent fasting eating pattern and someone who has been eating three meals a day plus snacks. It takes several weeks to a month. For example, if someone decides, okay, I'm going to quit eating breakfast. If they don't eat breakfast one day, they're going to be hungry and irritable, maybe not able to concentrate. And the reason is that their whole system is geared to having breakfast. Those initial, if you will, side effects will disappear within two weeks to a month. And in fact, in our studies of the brain where we look at activity in neural networks, we find that the adjustments of the neural networks to the intermittent fasting have the same time course. They're not seen right away. The idea that they don't have enough energy is simply not true. Going back to the evolutionary perspective, our species wouldn't, any animal species wouldn't be here today if their bodies and brains couldn't function well in a food-deprived state. Another analogy is with exercise. If someone's been sedentary for years and then they go out and try to run five miles, they're not going to feel very good. I don't think they'll hit the five-mile marker. <laughs> they're going to be tired, and a lot of people don't get into an exercise program because they just can't get over the hump and get in shape. But once they're in shape, if they stop exercising, they don't feel good. As far as the brain goes, similar time course of adjustments of these neural circuits that control mood, hunger, cognition. More anecdotally, people who switch to an intermittent fasting eating pattern and then for one reason or another stop, they don't feel good when they stop. So that's similar to exercise if you're adapted yeah. to it. How should someone determine if intermittent fasting would be a good thing for them to do? People who are overweight and haven't been able to get their weight down, they should try it. Studies that have been done, many people, if they can get through that initial, say, month adaptation period, they can change their eating patterns, stick with it. And in most cases, they'll lose weight. Turns out people don't overeat. They actually eat less food than they normally would in a 24-hour period when they're eating all their food within a six to eight-hour time window. Someone with prediabetes, I think it would be good for them whether or not they're overweight. Someone with uh, cardiovascular risk factors, bad lipid profile, cholesterol and triglycerides. People who are normal weight, they can try. There's studies coming out, for example, looking at people doing weightlifting while they're on intermittent fasting, and they're able to build muscle just as well as people not on intermittent fasting, and they tend to lose a little fat. Actually, bodybuilders have done this for decades. They, I guess, just by trial and error, discovered that if they don't eat breakfast and do their weightlifting at you know, lunchtime and then eat after that. So what they're doing there is when they're weightlifting, they've been fasting. They're actually enhancing the fat burning by doing the exercise at the end of the fasting period. Endurance athletes are become, actually becoming interested in this. It used to be that people who run crazy 100-mile runners, they would take essentially Gatorade or sugar. But it turns out it may be better if they are already switched to using fats 
before they start the event and just they've got plenty of fat stores to get them through it. How well versed or not are primary care physicians regarding this? Mostly not well versed. Hopkins physicians are more well versed. I would hope so. Yes. <laughs> I've actually uh, given lecture to the medical students during their intercession on intermittent fasting. Our New England Journal of Medicine article that came out last year it was a review article on intermittent fasting. Any physician worth their salt would take a look at the New England Journal. And there's many clinical trials going on now, together with patients coming to their physician and saying, hey, you know, I've been reading about intermittent fasting on the internet. I have a yeah. friend that tried it and said, hey, you know, it helped them lose weight. You know, what do you think? Rapidly, physicians are becoming aware of it. What they need to be aware of is this adaptation period of several weeks. They need to be aware that if they are able to communicate with their patients during this adaptation period in a way that gives them encouragement, like cheerleading, social media, or text messaging, you know, how you're doing, uh -huh. were you able to not eat breakfast, were you able to eat only 500 calories on these two days a week, and get them through that transition period. Some people, perhaps many, would come out on the other end being able to stick with the new eating path. Are there any side effects that someone should be very cognizant of before they would embark on this? Side effects have not really been documented in human and animal studies. Well, in females of reproductive age that already have a low body weight, it could adversely affect their estrus cycles. We did a study in animals, female rats, put them on uh -huh. every other day fasting. They kept cycling, but their cycles became more irregular. If you severely restrict calories, you can completely shut down estrus cycles. And that makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint. If you're a female in the wild and you're starving, if you got pregnant, you don't have any energy right. to support the growth of it. But anyway, yeah. so that's one potential thing. A woman that's overweight, it's not going to adversely affect their estrus cycles. Only people who are like girls with anorexia, obviously, that could be a problem. You talked about menstrual cycles. Whenever I look at the gymnastics team during the Olympics, and I just see how incredibly lean they are. And most of these girls have not started menses yeah. yet. They could be 15 or 16 years old, but they have zero body fat to jumpstart yeah. those ovaries. And I don't think that a lot of mothers even realize you've got to have some estrogen in you, some body fat, which is where we store estrogen, in order to jumpstart that puberty. Yes. It parallels the increase in overweight and obesity in the United States, there's been a reduction in the age of onset of puberty. So that's like the opposite thing. If kids are overnourished, they actually reach puberty more quickly. Sooner. Uh -huh. People need to try to have a normal body mass index with some fat, eat a healthy diet, Mediterranean type diet, etc. Get regular exercise, perhaps intermittent fasting can help them with reducing certain disease risk indicators. I view intermittent fasting as a something that's complementary to exercise and a healthy uh -huh. diet, keeping your mind intellectually challenged like we're doing now. I'm curious to know, since we have touched on cancer too, and I shared with you that I'm 28 years out from my first diagnosis, have you had an opportunity to make the rounds at Johns Hopkins and present at any of our cancer tumor boards? Not to the cancer groups. I've presented a lot to the School of Public Health and other departments. So I think I'm going to help change that. Okay. I'm in uh, Professor of Surgical Oncology, so we will have you further the education of our surgical oncologists, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists. Patients always ask, no matter what kind of cancer they have, is there something I should be eating or not be eating or what should I be doing? Because they're so in touch with their bodies, realizing, oh my gosh, my body grew cancer. I don't want that to happen again. What can I do to help not have that occur? We usually do talk to patients about you know, having a uh, healthier lifestyle. Stop the smoking, stop the drinking, get your weight down, exercise regularly as things that they can do. But usually they'll say, I've tried, but it's not working. This is a different way to be able to successfully do it, I think. 
Because what people will do, they'll say, it's like exercise. If I say, all I want you to do is power walk for 30 minutes, five times a week. I don't want you buying a gym membership and trying to become yeah. some, you know, galactic whatever. That's not what needs to happen. You can start that power walking five minutes and get it up to 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and take these baby steps, yes. if you will. Yes. And I see this very similarly. I think that people may start off saying, well, I'm going to have lunch at 12 and my dinner at 5. Then I'm going to try, right, the infamous try, not to have that bedtime snack of apple pie that I love to do. It may be that they start off eating between 11 and 7, maybe easier, and then get it to 12 and 5 eventually, right? Yeah. I think it's so important. Before we close, I want you to talk a little more, and I want to make sure that I'm spelling it right. You said GABA. Is that G-A-B-A? Yes, it's a neurotransmitter, gamma amino butyric acid. That it, should be on Jeopardy. That's uh, well, maybe question. If, if I were to ask, well, I'll ask you, name a neurotransmitter that you've heard of before. Any neurotransmitter? I don't know. Uh, I'll be just like our audience would say, I don't know. Dopamine, you've heard of? Maybe. Uh -huh. Serotonin? <laughs> dopamine, you've probably heard about in something you read or heard about addiction. And, and Parkinson's. And, and Parkinson's. And serotonin, you may have heard about related to depression. Most commonly use antidepressant drugs, boost serotonin. But it turns out the most important two neurotransmitters in the brain in many respects are glutamate, which is an excitatory amino acid. Throughout your brain, all the excitation of nerve cells in your brain is affected, induced by glutamate. And then GABA, is, it puts the brakes on glutamate so there's not uncontrolled neural network activity. So working together, glutamate and GABA maintain neural network activity within normal limits and are critical for learning and memory and everything our brain does. The other neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, they subtly modify the ongoing activity in the neural network. The first drugs used to treat anxiety disorders act by increasing GABA activity. Valium, diazepam, is probably the best known such drug, the, the benzodiazepines. Uh -huh. And they're still used somewhat in the clinic. Intermittent fasting enhances GABA tone, so it has this anti-anxiety effect, and it also helps the neural network's activity be refined and controlled in ways that optimize brain function. You know, I can see a t-shirt that says, don't mess with my GABA. Yeah, that would be good. I think during a time as we are in right now with the pandemic and mm. people being home, and they are being more sedentary, unfortunately, and snacks are readily available, and not necessarily healthy snacks either, that it has been reported that people are gaining weight. That can get you in that catch-22 of you can't get out of it, that they're anxious, they're depressed, they're frustrated, and so they'll have that snack of a candy bar or whatever, and they find that they're kind of eating all the time while they're sitting on their computer or sitting on their sofa or wherever that they are, this may be a truly an ideal time for them to take stock in their health and say, what can I do to improve my health? We know that when New Year's Eve comes, the most common things that people have as their New Year's resolution is that they're going to lose weight. I think it's supposed to be like 76% of New Year's resolutions are tied to, I'm going to lose weight. And gym memberships go up in January, February, and then they go down starting in March because they said, this was harder than I thought, so I'm not going to do it. But what you described today, you don't have to go somewhere to do it, which is helpful, and it's doable. You know, when we ask somebody to do something, and it's really going to be incredibly hard to do, the possibility of success is low. But I certainly would see that the probability of success with this is should be pretty high. And when they learn what it can accomplish for them, not just weight reduction, but other really important things, it seems like it takes us away from take this pill to accomplish whatever, get your body to do whatever. This is something they have control over. And I'm a firm believer that when people are anxious, certainly when individuals are diagnosed with cancer, their life is out of control. Wherever we can help them with that gives them control. What do they have control over so that they can more actively participate in the decision-making? 
about their care and help themselves. I think you've hit the nail on the head that this not only does it work, but it is truly doable. It's doable and families could do it, change everything pattern together, make it a challenge each other to get through the first two weeks to a month and stick with it. Yes. That's fabulous. Thank you so much for joining me today. I know that our audience has truly learned a great deal of brand new information that they didn't know anything about. And who knows, maybe they will create a Jeopardy column that's going to focus specifically on intermittent fasting, and they'll know all of the answers because of you. I enjoyed our conversation, Lily, and um, I look forward to investigations with uh, oncology folks. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to get you all around those timber boards. Yes, be be great discussion because medical oncology, surgical oncology, radiation oncology, pathology, genetics, the nurse practitioners, the nurse navigators, the social workers, all attend those because we have such a large volume of types of cancers that we treat at Hopkins. There's a breast cancer tumor board, a lung cancer tumor board, a brain cancer tumor board, all specializing. And I'm going to have you front and center. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Take care and thank you again. Thank you for listening to A Woman's Journey podcast. Join me, Kelly Gear Ripkin, your host, Lily Shockney, and a variety of Johns Hopkins experts on the first Thursday of each month to learn about medical advances in women's health. A Woman's Journey is grateful for the unrestricted educational grants from HRH Foundation that supports our podcast series, Insights That Matter. For more information about A Woman's Journey's virtual programs occurring throughout the year and our monthly webcasts and podcasts, visit our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey. Like us on Facebook and Twitter and visit our website at hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey. Until next time, stay well.